Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome to our workshop um, about applying an asset-based community development approach to bereavement peer support. Um, uh, we are recording today and um, for anyone that can't make it today um, and wants to watch it back afterwards or if you have colleagues or friends who you think would find today useful then we'll be sending you the recording afterwards so feel free to share it far and wide. Um, my name is Claire, I work for Bristol Ageing Better um, and as you probably know by now this workshop is one of many in the festival of co-production and um, with all different types of co-production learning being shared um, and after the festival it will be followed by a toolkit. So everything that we say today and um, the information about this group and this approach is also available in the toolkit once that's launched as well. Um, so I guess just a bit of housekeeping. It's great to see so many people with their videos on. That's always really lovely as a presenter that you're not just talking to the ether. Um, but because we are recording, if anyone doesn't want their video shown on the recording, then feel free to just turn off your camera, do whatever you are comfortable with really. Um, we are going to have a question and answer session at the end of today's workshop. Um, so if you can, if it's available to you, um, please write your questions in the chat. That's just the best way for us to keep track of it. Um, and you don't need to hold on to your question the whole time. You can write it in the chat whenever you think of it, um, but then we'll come to them all at the end. So without further ado, I am happy to welcome Jan um, to the virtual stage. Um, Jan is a community development worker who was working in one of the projects funded by Bristol Ageing Better um, and is now a freelance trainer and a coordinator of an ever-growing network of star bereavement peer support groups. So over to you, Jan. Thank you. Um, so first of all, what is a community? So when, it, when I'm embarking on any, uh, trying to set up any initiative in the community to benefit the people in the community, in the neighbourhood, it's important to think about what is our community and what it consists of. So that's something, the question I put out to people when I'm out and about in the community, what does our community look like? Um, what does it consist of? Um, in the community that I was working in, um, so as Clara said, I was funded by Bristol Ageing Better. Um, I was employed by St Monica Trust at the time, but I was also a resident that lived in the community that I was working in. And um, so really important to be to linking up, finding out what exists in the community and mapping those assets that ex exist within the community. So in terms of applying the asset-based community development approach, um, linking up and connecting with people in the communities and to receive support in helping to, to develop um, an initiative in the community and look at sustainability of that new project that I was um, trying to put together in the community. So in terms of asset-based community development approach, we're looking at the institutions that exist within the community the associations that exist within the community and the individuals that exist within the community. And with every group that I'm trying to support that's, that want to set up something in the community is getting people to, to look at things differently, look at, at things that, um, with like the half, the glass is half full, what fantastic assets exist, what gifts do people have in our community that they can support and what we're trying to, to, to um, achieve. Um, I'll just zoom in here. So if we look at the institutions in the Stockwood community where I live and where I was working at the time, um, we have institutions such as the, the shops, the co-op, um, we have funeral directors, we have shelter, sheltered housing. So there's six sheltered housing establishments in Stockwood. We have a fantastic children's centre. Um, a Mario's Cafe, social centres, a fantastic library, two pubs, social club, BS14 club, three parks, three schools, a nursery, a scout hut, 
dentists, opticians, barbers, hairdressers, a sports club, three allotments, football club, charity shop, medical centre, the list goes on. When we look at those institutions, what do they, what gifts do they have to give? So we start looking at things like um, staff time, approaching people to see if they've got time to support our initiative, resources, gifts in kind that we can be approaching these institutions to help us set up our new initiative, the services that they provide, the contacts and that they, they make in the community, the people they reach, how they can help us market what we're trying to achieve in our community and how they can engage with us. So an example of where I've um, mapped in the community those institutions, I've approached uh, the local children's centre. They're, they're fantastic. They're marketing on social media for us, for our, our um our bereavement group that we've set up. They are able to give us access to administration resources, stationery, photocopying, um, printing, um, their time and commitment to help us because they value what we're doing. Um, the funeral directors, for instance, they're happy to display material that we've produced and give that out to people in the community. Um, the medical centre, for instance, they've put all of the information about our lovely group up onto the big screen when people, when we are allowed to wait in, in um, medical centres waiting rooms, it would come up on the screen. They would give all the staff information to hand out to those people they're making in contact, in contact with. Um, and the list goes on. We are looking at not uh, applying for funding, uh, but gifts in kind and support from those institutions within our community. The next circle we see here is about uh, associations. So in your community, you will be ha you inevitably have, it, have groups that have formed to do different things in the community that you can approach. And again, they've got lots of gifts that they can support with any new initi initiative. We have a group of newbies that meet in the library for anybody that, that uh, moves to the area can access information about what's going on. Positivity, having tea in the library, um, positive story sharing and things like that. We've got a repair cafe, a lunch club, a youth club, Horizons and a popping club that's been going for 30 odd years um, where people come and, and socialise. Walking gr groups, Tai Chi, the Star Bereavement Peer Support Group is an association. Quiz groups, yoga, dance, skittles, a movie club. Stockwood Growing Together as a community garden project. Painting, Happy Notes Choir, indoor bowling, a gospel choir, and, and a couple of art groups. So these we see as associations, groups that have come together, they've established um, a cohort of people that have the same interests that want to be together. And again, we look at what gifts do they have to give? Well, they're part of a network because we're connecting with each other. Um, again, they, they're, they work in partnership with each other because they're able to market. They've got so much experience and skills between them. And the more connect connected they are, the more we can be um, helping each other to develop our passion and whatever we're doing in our community. Um, and then we look at individuals. So everyone has something to give. Um, not everyone's happy to share those things, but what things that people are happy to share is a fantastic asset within our community. Unless we talk to people, we make those connections in our community. We don't know what's out there. So um, we don't know, you know, if we, how can we know what we, what we want unless we already know what we have in our community. So we've got retired people, older people, younger people, middle-aged, stay-at-home parents, church congregations, local workers, etc who, you know, equally all have skills, some time, they know the neighbourhood, um, they could, they've got lots of knowledge about the community as well, if they're involved in the associations and things that happen in their community. 
So this is sort of painting a picture, really, of what the community looks like. Um, it's, it's something you can't do overnight. The more people you connect with, the more people can bring information so that you, you eventually have a visual sort of representation of what your community assets are. Um, there, uh, there is, in every local authority, you can go on and um, look Google the Joint um, Strategic Needs Assessment, which you can download from your local authority um, website. Uh, the demographics of every community but it doesn't tell you all the assets, the fantastic assets that exist within your community. So it's a, a positive spin on um, what, what we're looking at here when we're looking at asset-based community development, looking at people's personal qualities, knowledge, skills, relationships, interest and passions, time and commitment. Um, on the side of here, we've got a plus sign which says on the edge. So we're looking at the wider community and um, other support that we need to be thinking about as well and I'll talk about a bit more about that in a moment. So asset-based community development approach is built on four foundations. Um, it focuses on community assets, strengths rather than problems and needs. It identifies and mobilizes individuals and community assets, skills and passions. It's community driven, building communities from the inside out and it's relationship driven. So people working together with a shared goal and common purpose can make the impossible possible. So here's just uh, making things happen within our community without the constraints of governing rules. So we've got these people in our community. We can see them like Batman and Robin getting out there, doing really good for the community. The community is a spontaneous place. Let's make things happen. And then all of a sudden, bang, we go into the systems that people often say, nope, you have to do it this way, have to do it that way. Um, and they're not good. So sometimes a simple good thing can be ruined by things like funding, for instance. So here's the funding. And by the way, here's the rules. Um, so, oh no, our fun idea has been turned into a programme. Um, so all those fantastic things that people come towards to, to make happen in their community, suddenly, um, if, you, if you're looking at funding, you're almost looking at this is not going to be a sustainable because somebody has to continue applying for funding because funding eventually will run out. Um, so, yeah. And our role when we're trying to do initiate new things in our community, I think um, I see myself as a bu the butler, really. So I'm doing the sort of behind the scenes, enabling, empowering people to come together so that when I step away from my role, those that wonderful creation of bringing people together to develop a community, it continues. Everyone takes ownership of it and there's Great, uh, a good foundation that's built between those people. So reflecting while I was talking about the mapping community assets and building this model of um, what exists in the community. So this is our community of Stockwood here and we've um, established lots of things that are going on in the community. So on the edge of this, looking at the assets on the wider community, we have, um, we've got a map of all of the other connections that, uh, not just, but when I've, when I've um, established a group that want, uh, they've got the common purpose of, of developing a particular project in their community, is getting us to look outside the box on the edge and approaching organisations that could also support what we're trying to achieve. Um, so we link up with people the top of the list for me is Age UK Bristol, Bristol Age and Better, that um, absolutely recognise what we're trying to achieve in our community to, to connect with people and reduce social isolation and loneliness in our community. And um, through connection with Bristol Age and Better, Age UK Bristol, who has a fantastic network across Bristol, Bath, uh, North Somerset and South Gloucester, 
Gloucestershire as well connected people to um, spread information out and get information out uh, far and wide um, and that doesn't cost our lovely little group in Stockwood it doesn't cost us a penny but, we, but the asset for us is having that fantastic connection on the edge. Um, there's organisations such as uh, St Peter's Hospice I've, we've made contact with, Macmillan Cancer Nurses, um, Community Asset Support Service, which is about mental health within Bristol, um, Cruise that gives bereavement support, um, not just in Bristol, but um, across the UK, St Monica Trust. Um, we've had um, interest from the University of West of England, the Bristol University, doing lots of research on um, organisations trying to get out in, uh, into the community and um, offer peer support. Um, Bristol City Council, for instance, is a fantastic asset to us because they've got community um, development practitioners that really value what we're trying to achieve and support us in many, many ways. Um, well aware as a database through the care forum that we we put our information on as well and that that can spread out into the across Bristol um, so we we come up with another picture of all these fantastic that exist within our community and on the edge and what the um, the connections we make in the wider community on the edge are things such as signposting, people making referrals, for referrals to our star bereavement peer support group. The more people that know about it, the more people are able to signpost people um, to our, our service that we're created in our community. Spreading the word uh, within the public health sector, it's been amazing. Um, I'm getting more and more people asking questions um, that are interested in doing something very similar in their community and um, it gives recognition with health professionals of the value to the NHS and public health what we're trying to achieve in our community. Helping with research, as I say the Bristol um, University and University West of England have been asking us to um, if we can help with research they're doing, which will be fed back into um, the, you know, um, clinical uh, commissioning group and beyond. Free marketing, I mean, that costs um, lots of money. We don't have any money. So all the marketing we can get, the good, fantastic marketing, um, you know, by tapping into other organisations is, is a great asset. Networking and encouraging like-minded community development workers to explore the STAR model and setting up their own group. That's, we've, that's been able to happen because those connections that we've made on the edge and with, within the wider community. I mean, at that point, I think, well, I'll, I'll just sort of touch on um, this, this model that I'm going to be talking about in a moment. Um, the peer support model um, has been um, 20, 25 people last year across Bristol did the training with me. Um, I cascaded the information and from that we've got five um, uh, star bereavement peer support groups that have been set up across Bristol and we've got 17 people at the moment um, in Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire have just finished doing the training as well and we're running it again another um, another time in July we're running it again and we're running it again in October um, so eventually we would love to see across Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire and beyond um, following this model to create um, a sustainable peer support project. So this is the timeline of um, the, um, using the um, asset-based community development approach. Um, so this, this using that approach will enable any group to build a solid foundation and establish a self-governing and self-sustainable uh, community association in their community, yeah. So the timeline of the Stockwood Star is um, in April 2019, um, I sent out a plea using an application called Nextdoor. So I don't know if you're all familiar with this um, application. It's it's um, uh, social media 
going through is free. It's nothing like, like Facebook at all, but you're able to sign up to it. And um, it's, uh, it's international. Um, it, you put your postcode in and you can see who is on this application, who's registered on next door. You can look at a map, you can see which houses have got uh, Wi-Fi and they've, they're connected on next door. And once you're on there, you can post and share information about different things that are going on in your community. So I used this application and as an individual live, living in the Stockwood community, I sent out, I wrote a plea to, to find out if there was anybody else in the community that wanted to help me set up a bereavement peer support group. Um, I sort of gave an idea of the people, the type of people that I was looking for, because you obviously need to be a good listener. You have to have empathy. If you have the, um, gone through the bereave, any bereavement um, and you're, you're wanting in your to, to care and support other people that are going through difficult um, times in their life through a loss of a loved one, um, please come forward and let me know. And I was absolutely amazed within 24 hours, I had six people respond. Um, over the next couple of months, I went out into the community and I, walk, I was walking around and talking to different people. Um, and I approached different people in, in some of the associations that exist in the community. And I asked people if they were interested in helping me to set up this bereavement peer support group. And um, I got a total of 13 people. Um, over a period of time, made it very transparent that it will take time and commitment. Um, once we've got established those foundations, we will then be able to um, promote what we, we've developed and we will open the doors to the community. Um, and uh, over the few months, we, um, we established then there was eight out of those 13 people that were able to give their time and commitment and not everyone was able to give the time and commitment to actually set it up, which is great to know because we know then we've got a committed core team. So um, in May 2019, we secured a venue. So again, a great asset in our community. We had two, we've got two churches. One of the churches said, you can use our community room on the side of the building free of charge we will because we value what you're doing um they gave us a key to the building they said help yourself to anything you want you can use the kitchen all the resources we have here help yourself um and so we then began in june 2019 started to plan with our team and i'll share with you in a moment what, what things we covered um so from June to October, we covered lots of different things. And eventually, when we felt, with our team felt 100% confident, we chose a date to open the doors and um, to the people in our community to offer this service. In, um, so it was, it's, it's done by the people in the community for the people in the community. And none of us are volunteering for anybody. We actually established this group um, in what, and, and, and uh, the group dynamics. It means that obviously every time a star bereavement peer support group is set up, um, wherever it is in, in our other communities, they will be very different. Um, but the core sort of principles are embedded in that group. During the, the planning and setting up stage, we looked at things such as uh, what would the session look like? Um, we also, we didn't have a name at that time either. And that was one of the things I asked everyone within our team um, to go away and think about of a, a name that will, people will remember. And somebody came back with Star. So it's Share, Talk and Remember. And we thought that was absolutely fantastic name. So um, within the group, we have somebody that likes to play around with making up logos and things like that and look at doing um, mar uh, the marketing um, and publicity material. Um, so that, that's, that's what was created then. Star logo, Stockwood star and some um, material 
about what, what we were trying to achieve. Um, we talked about what the sessions will look like, and that was looking at things like um, the material things we needed, the resources we felt we needed. It is a wish list. Um, we, we had a room, obviously, and we wanted to look at making it a very comfortable and welcoming space. Um, we wanted to, to um, uh, look at um, being able to display literature from other organisations that can offer support um, alongside what we were supporting people with. Um, we wanted to have um, internet access so we could use a laptop, for instance, and, and show videos and um, different clips um, uh, of interest uh, uh, within our group. We needed to have the obvious things, um, you know, as tea and coffee making facilities and things like that, a warm space with lots of information that people can take away. Um, we also looked at what the sessions would look like in terms of the structure. Um, we did uh, lots of role play um, and how we felt that we could manage a two hour session. Um, so we created a structure of a, mini, a, a beginning, a middle and an end. What that would look like, what would we be saying to people in the beginning how, in, and encouraging people to, um, to, feel, to, to talk in the group? Um, and how would we end the session where people take something away and reflect on what we've been talking in the group? We looked at roles and responsibilities and uh, we, we came up with the, some basic um, roles and responsibilities. However, we all tend to chip in and cover each other. We all know what needs to be done. We've gone through things um, uh, and uh, looked at, you know, having somebody welcoming at the door, somebody helped to, to do the marketing, just going out and talking to people. Um, we offer people um, a one-to-one -one, um, appointment where we just sit down and have a cup of tea with them and tell them all about it before they actually come along to our group. So they've they're not got any, um, you know, they're, they're not anxious about coming along. They're very clear on what we're doing. And um, we've got somebody obviously making teas and coffees, and that's fantastic because they do a really brilliant job um, and bringing cakes or biscuits and things like that to to, to the sessions. And um, we have people that do um, different roles to do the administration and things like that. Um, and obviously we need to be thinking about who's going to be the main point of contact and those type of things as well. So we spent a lot of time establishing the roles and responsibilities, what that would look like, and people sort of organically fell into those roles because what, you know, we looked at what people could bring to this group um, and what they felt comfortable doing within the group in the team. We spent time looking at theories and models. We did some training with St. Peter's Hospice. We also did lots of research and we established the, 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 um, the best way of, um, there was three models that we have actually adopted to share with everyone that comes along for support. And um, everyone's confident in, uh, in talking about those models um, of bereavement and grief. Um, and we also, um, we produced a welcome pack with information about these three models of bereavement, um, and uh, and they they're very um, very valuable within our pack that we give to everyone that comes along for support. Um, we we also did lots of work on a group agreement plan. Some people call it a constitution. We call it the terms our terms of reference, and it's a code of conduct in our standards which we all agree, we all put together. We spoke about so many things, looking at contingency plans and things like that. Um, but most importantly, that we there's no hierarchy within our group. We all equally valued that we can all bring things, different things to our group. And that, um, but we had to agree on what we needed to, um, to put into place to create good standards because otherwise how can you evaluate what you're doing if you've got no sort of set standards to know that you're doing what you intended to do. So that was um, work in progress for a long, long time and we still go back now and again and we, we tweak our terms of reference. Um, so we have um, our, our core standards within, included in that. Uh, 
and our work ethics, training for the and support for the team and within the team. So my background is um, obviously in adult education and training and community development. And I've done so many um, courses that I was at uh, and different um, things that I could bring to the group. So myself, I did the training within the team. Um, uh, so looking at things like communication skills um, and uh, how, how we sort of gonna be interacting and responding, reacting to different situations within our group. I mean, safeguarding obviously was a big one as well. So we came up with lots of things. When we got to know each other within our group, um, we were then able to know where people felt not so confident and therefore what training we would need. And if with any star group or any community group, if you've made those external contacts in the wider community, um, you will inevitably be able to contact organizations to come and do some free training for you if they really value what you're trying to achieve. It doesn't cost anything. You just need to make the right connections to get people to come in and do specific training for your group. So here's an example of um, an activity which is really useful when you're bringing anybody together to establish a group. Um, and it's about looking at the gifts, the assets that we all have as individuals. Um, so looking at those skills through the experiences we've had, the training we may have had, the work we may have, have um, undertaken, volunteering, for instance, our interests and our passions. And um, this, this is something I did actually a, a couple of weeks ago where I've got a group of people um, that are coming together to set up their own star bereavement peer support group in their community. Um, they all come as with different hats on because they're different jobs that they're currently doing. Um, but we established within literally half an hour that these are some absolutely fantastic skills and experiences that most of us would not, we could be working with people or connected with people for a long, long time and we wouldn't necessarily know all these things about each other. So sharing stories and doing an activity where we're able to talk about the things that we've um, explored in our lives um, can bring out um, some fantastic results here. Um, so somebody, for instance, might come to set up a bereavement peer support group and say, I'm, I don't like talking in the group, but I'm happy to make teas and coffees. Um, and that's absolutely fantastic. However, they may have, like some of these people here, some um, uh, somebody's got um, a web design experience, for instance, uh, work um, experience of working in social media. Somebody's got um, experience of working in the general public in the NHS, um, setting up activities in the community, organising different activities in the community, and um, connecting with various people in a networking, fundraising experience counselling experience, um, somebody's a trained yoga um, uh, instructor, um, somebody has got um, a creative writing experience for instance and the list goes on and on and uh, before you know it within half an hour we're like wow look at this fantastic asset exists when this small group of people and what we could be bringing to our star bereavement peer support group if we we know that this exists within our group we can go off in many different ways and give added value to what we're trying to create it takes it takes one person to start explore to, to share share their experiences and their stories and then before you know it other people feel comfortable to do it um, So in our, our Star Bereavement Peer Support Group in Stockwood, we feel that it's really important, first of all, people tend to sort of make assumptions that it looks like um, a, a very well organized um, business or um, entity within the community. Um, we, wanna, we wanna be clear um, to show, to show to people that we are not a constituted business or a charity. We're not a registered company or public service as such. Um, we're not managed by a governing body. We are not a counselling service. We're not a service giving advice and guidance. 
we are not an organization that charges anything. Um, it does not have a selection criteria and we do not have a waiting list. Um, so we thought it was really important for people to know that first before we tell people what we actually are and what the benefits are. So um, the Stockwood Star project is a voluntary community group. This is own ent entity, um, a service which enhances and give added value to the public health. Um, it focuses on the asset based community development approach. Um, it's a secular community service. So everyone is welcome, regardless of any faith and beliefs or no, no faith and belief. An organization where there is no hierarchy. So everyone that's, that's part of our team and everyone that, uh, that joins to come along for support, is, they're all equally valued. A safe place where people are, are welcomed, able to listen to others, talk, share stories, cry, laugh, receive care and support and just be. It's free and offering two peer support sessions per month. So we currently run um, the first Tuesday of every month from one till three, the third Wednesday of every month from four till six. And we'd, we'd love to be able to offer more sessions as things progress. Um, it's an inclusive environment, welcoming diversity and quality for all adults over the age of 18. It provides signposting. So we provide information of other organizations that are, that are out in our community and the wider community um, about um, support that they can give. Um, there's no selection, selection criteria or waiting list. Um, so people make an initial contact with the literature that we send out and we meet them on a one-to-one -one basis and give them everything they need you can ask us lots of questions and if they feel confident that they want to come along they just join the next session. There's no time limit people can come along as often as they want and as long as they want and it doesn't cost any money to run it it's just time and commitment for everyone involved and gifts in kind. So there's a our leaflet or trifold leaflet we send out out into the wider community and beyond. So anybody that is interested, we are encouraging people to contact us because although we're covering um, Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire, um, we've got a fantastic arrangement with Bristol Age and Better, Age UK Bristol um, and the connections we've made um, to, to be cascading this model and through training um, to, to encourage more people to come forward and, uh, and set something up in their community. So if you're interested, um, please get in contact with us, you can, either through um, Claire from uh, Age UK Bristol or myself, There's my contact details and you'll have copies of this. Um, and that's it really. Um, open to any questions. Amazing, thank you, Jan. Um, we've had some questions come through in the chat and different comments and things, which is great. Um, so that we can all see each other as we're a fairly small group and have a bit of a um, discussion, if that's what people want. Um, do you mind, yes, just stopping your screen share and then we can have a, yeah, a bit more of an info. Yeah. Um, so I'll just go through the questions, I guess, um, and then but people feel free to ask more as we go along. Um, so one of the first questions that came through when you were showing that asset-based community development screen um, was around, is there an electronic way of doing that asset-based mapping um, so that it can be easily updated as work evolves? Do you know of anything? Um, I don't know of anything, no. It is time consuming, yeah. Mm -hmm. I would say that I would personally, if you wanted to create a model like that and you didn't, weren't happy doing it on the computer is to um to send to, to get a, a template a blank one if you like and to 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 write on it and then you can always with our technology nowadays you take a photograph of it then can't you you can upload it onto onto a computer that would be the easiest way of doing it yeah 
Yeah, it's so hard, isn't it? Because as soon as you, with asset based, um, with the asset mapping, as soon as you create something, things constantly change. New things pop up, things close, pause, move around. So it's sort of a constant thing, isn't it? It is, yeah, yeah. Um, Robin has asked, how have the groups fared during lockdown? How have the groups? How have the groups fared during okay. lockdown? Well, with the the Stockwood, um, our Stockwood one, which I'm I'm obviously still I'm still involved with the stock one in Stockwood, um, it was very difficult, and we we had to go through like a month by month or week by week sometimes, um, by keeping in contact and and um, being <laughs> confident that we were, were complying with the government um, rules, if you like, about social distancing and all the PPE and all those sort, types of things. So when we were allowed in the beginning. Um, it was coming up to the sort of springtime and we've got a really good connection with a community garden project which is next door to the venue that we were using and um, uh, so we were able to do lots of uh, sessions outside in the garden um, and it's got a covered area as well um, and they were like yes please use the garden we we, we want to this is just an absolute blessing to have this wonderful space so let's use it. Um, so that's what we did. We also um, we changed the the venue because the church was closed. It wasn't allowed to open, obviously. So the children's centre said we could use the space because that wasn't being used either. Um, so we we alternated when we were allowed to, to sit outside because weather permitting, we'd sat outside. And then when we could, we reduced the size of our group so we ran we changed the the times that we were running um we reduced the amount of um of our team that so we, had, we had a rotor put in place so only two members of the team um so we you know looking at the size of the group that we we're able to, able to support and uh, reduce that size so then we had a rotor so we had to make a, a few adjustments but uh some people that felt confident to come along um, came along and other people we um, maintain, maintain contact with them through the telephone so that we they knew we were still thinking of them and you know that communication continued yeah and I think you being able to be so flexible with your venue and um, just shows again the value of doing spending that time doing the asset mapping at the beginning because yes the original venue okay you can't meet there but you already know what else is available um, and including outside spaces in that as well. I imagine they can be e fairly easily forgotten, um, but yes. asset, especially during the pandemic. Yeah, definitely. Yes. Um, we have a question specific to next door. And um, so Nikki said that um, she's on next door, um, but lives in another area to where she works. Mm -hmm. um, do you know whether it's possible to use the app if you don't live in the area where you're looking, I guess, to message people? I think um, somebody asked this question the other day, actually, in the training. They were saying, uh, if you don't live in the area, how do you know who, who to make contact with and everything? But you need to make that initial contact with some somebody. Eventually, the more talking and connecting you go out into the community, people, more people you talk to, you will um, start growing gradually gradually get what your community looks like and so we actually were thinking of um, things like the local councillors for instance um, the local in your local authority presumably will ha you will have community development practitioners try and find out who the one um, you know that you can contact that covers your area they should already have started or they should already have some sort of mapping in place of different um, associations and different organizations that are out there trying to support people in the community. Um, Age UK Bristol, I mean I, I go to Age UK Bristol saying okay you know we need to, who, who can I be connecting with um, and uh, you know, people are really welcome to support you if they can, if they've already got um, information about different networks and things that are going on in their community. So it's it's there. Yeah, the more people you talk to, the, eventually you'll start being able to add to that profile, that that uh, circular um, image, if you like, of all those um, uh, all those uh, people that are out there that can support you. Um, um 
Sorry, um, Jenny, uh, Jenny actually um, messaged me back sort of privately and uh, she uses the Neighbourhood app. Mm. Um, so um, I'm going to give that a try as well. Good to know. Is Sorry, where was that? The Neighbourhood app. So oh, I'm going right. to have a look about that. So, yeah. Good to know. Lovely. Good to try I mean, things, isn't it? Hmm. Um, well aware in Bristol we've got um, the well aware database so we can put uh, put postcodes in there or specific subjects that you're looking for and that will bring up if people are registered on well aware it's a database that you can uh, find um, all of those uh, organizations that are out there on there um, but yeah it literally is is um it's it's a it's a, it's a long job to do, but the more people you connect with, the more people can be doing that as well with you. Um, and you can pull that information together. Mm. Um, Anna's asked about um, whether the STAR network addresses the issue of living grief and bereavement, and um, particularly where families are caring for a person with dementia um, and has put a really useful um, free training resource in the chat. Um, which I personally mm. didn't know about, so I, I would definitely save that and share it. Um, but I don't know, Jan, whether mm. you wanted to um, sort of explain a bit about it is a bereavement peer support group, but it's also not just about um, just bereavement, it's sort of other losses as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. And that's something that we put in our literature, that it says that it's about um, bereavement through loss of a loved one. Um, but it's also about any um, difficult challenges, things we go through in our lives, um, transition periods of our of, um, so we, part of the training that I do is, is looking at all of those things where we experience loss in our lives, loss in relationships, um, loss in identity, loss in um, all sorts of things and the effect it has on us. Um, and that we're there, none of us are experts, if you like, we're there because we have experienced so many different things, but we have understanding and we're there to listen. And the value of that is enormous. The feedback we get from people that come along to talk about different things where they've experienced loss. Mm -hmm. um, and so some people, um, there are people in Bristol that have done the, the star bereavement Peer support training and they are working with groups of people with dementia or carers of people with dementia and how much they are grieving mm. um, they still have their loved one but they are grieving from the loss through the dementia and um, so that is is very important that this can be applied in any situation but the, the pure you know fact of sitting and listening to others um, is, is is amazing yeah the reward is amazing. Yeah. And th thank you so much, Anna, for sharing that resource. And um, I guess if anyone else is aware of any other resources, feel free to share that in the chat too. Um, it's all, the approach is all yeah. about kind of sharing what we know and what might be helpful for other people. Um, so thank you for mm. that. Um, Shardas, um, for, who's from the Birmingham um, Aging Better um, programme, has just said uh, that she's really interested in doing this in Birmingham. Um, and are we doing training on the kind of peer support and other bereavement trainings in Birmingham? Um, I think, as Jan said, please get in contact if you, because we are funded, um, our clinical commissioning group, our CCG here, has funded the training um, for Bristol, North Somerset and South Gloucestershire. Um, so that's what we're focusing on, but it's so relevant for other parts of the country and we're so passionate about this model. Um, so we are at the moment are kind of evaluating what we're currently doing, collecting case stories, finding out the impact that it has on people. But we're so keen to share it really across the country and in other countries as well. Um, so if anyone you know might be interested in this, um, any of your own sort of councils or community development groups or um, clinical commissioning groups, mental health, anything like that, um, just get in touch with us really and we can see see what's possible um, yeah did you have anything else to add to that yeah so every no i'm just going to say that so everyone that does the training it's free to them but somebody needs to obviously uh, enable that to happen in that local authority so as clara was saying we we're limited on what we can give it within our Bristol, north somerset and south cross area 
roundtable saying that we could would love to share in other um, local authorities. And if somebody wants to sort of have the same setup in their local authority, that's what we'd like to, to negotiate with people um, and make it happen. Um, but Clara say it, we, we're excited because we've had people from um, Wales and we've had somebody from Spain and we had somebody from America um, and um, yeah, and different parts of the UK as well saying, I'd really love to hear about what you've been doing and would love to sort of be involved in this. I said, we would love to, to, to talk with you about it and everything else. But the actual reality is we can't, we can't, um, can't offer this is free to that locality that we're working at the moment um, but with sh sharing information is is fantastic because we all um it's so valuable isn't it to hear about our experiences that we're going through in our communities and it's it is a hard slog we're all trying to do our best so um if we can network um then that's that's wonderful to be able to do that mm -hmm. exactly and i know in terms of training um for other related areas like jan was saying if there's a specific thing that you want training on, often if, if you have done the asset mapping, um, you might be able to negotiate getting that um, from somebody for free. Um, and I know a fair few hospices um, can provide different resources and trainings, um, either in person or you know, online or recorded um, around general issues around bereavement and loss and associated things like that, which is just really worth sort of doing research about that. There might be something that's useful for what you're looking for. Mm. Um, um, Judith has asked, um, what's the average size of the group? Um, we um, are, are, we've got six core members of our team now that run the project, run the group. Um, we've we've um, supported over the past uh, couple of years, we've supported 15 people uh, that come for support. Um, the big, the, the, the largest size we have at any one time, the, the group is, there's, uh, I think there's 10 of us, we go in, in the group and most people, because of the pandemic, most people now choose to come on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Um, in the beginning, when we had less people to support, we were, they were able to come Tuesday and a Wednesday if they wanted to. Um, but we were in a position where we can be very, very flexible. So, as things grow, we want to make sure we never have about more than 10 people in the group, 10 to 12 people in a group, because it loses that, um, it loses that sort of um, uh, comfortable sort of side of things. You know, people feel it's yeah. quite, uh, it's very friendly and um, we get to know each other very well. And so it can be sort of ruined a little bit if we have the group get bigger and bigger. So we would then look at trying to run more sessions so people can, uh, we don't turn anybody away. We'll, we'll always adapt to, uh, accordingly if we can. Thank you. And just to add to that, because we've recently been um, finding out um, sort of the impact, what impact it's had on group members and sort of talking to people about that. And um, I definitely know that some have said that what they really value is because it is a slightly smaller group, having that time to share without feeling pressured um, mm -hmm which sometimes when groups are bigger and um, yeah, they don't have, and that's why they value this. So it's just about complementing what else is out there. Other people would much prefer a bigger group, I'm sure. And um, it's what's right for people, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. And we do, uh, we, we're always asking people, and as part of our core value and work ethics, we say to people, if you're unhappy, please don't leave without not telling one of us, you know, well, we all, we always, um, make a point of making pe people feel comfortable that they're able to say um, how they're feeling before they leave. Um, and we also welcome people to bring ideas to the group. Um, so people make suggestions sometimes, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we did this or that? And then um, we sort of put it out and we sort of, yeah, we, we, we welcome that because uh, it makes people feel that they're valued valued in what they can bring to the group they're coming for support but actually they bring so much with them mm -hmm. which is wonderful and um, so robin's asked a question about um how do you retain volunteers and prevent dropout and um, so robin coordinates a one-to-one -one peer support service for people living with type 2 diabetes um, and are looking to set up a peer support group in bristol and um, so yeah how do you do you have any advice on sort of retaining people and preventing volunteers dropping out 
Well, you, you, I think it's about being transparent. Everyone needs to know that when you're setting something up, it doesn't, it does involve an awful lot of time. When you've done the built the foundations, we don't, we feel like we're we're not actually doing anything, and often quite a few in the, in our team say we we actually not doing anything. We are, we are, we're coming along. The feedback we get is fantastic. So the fact that we're providing this wonderful space, people feel safe. We're there to listen. We are, that's, that, that's, that's our reward, knowing what the, the you know, the feedback we get, the, the difference we're making. Um, so, but from in the very beginning, people need to know, when I, so I say there were 13 people that have experienced an interest in setting up the Stockwood Star, eventually we ended up with eight people because, um, and that's not a negative, I see that as a positive because then we, we know that these people have got the time because it did involve a lot of time and um, so we're not making it, making it look nice and fluffy and, and disguising anything, we're being very transparent of time, put it in, builds that foundation and the reward is that we then sometimes thinking we're not doing very much, but actually it's because we've done we've done it all. We've done we've looked at all sorts of um, contingency plans we sort of put into place just in case, just in case, just in case. Um, it took a lot of time. Um, I think it was about seven, eight, seven or eight months to to get everything in place. We're always tweaking things. We're, le a, we're on a learning curve, but um, we've got those committed people. Now, if anybody do, they do drop drop off. It would be through personal commitments that um, uh, that we all go through, and um, so we're always trying to be mindful that we we want to try and get more and more people interested to support us on the outside as well. Um, and uh, you know, when people are feel confident, they might come along to support. For instance, say, I don't want to come along and be part of your sessions but I wouldn't mind helping just to do some promotion for you and deliver leaflets out in the community or talk to people for you um, and eventually when they feel more comfortable they might sit in the session or come along and make tea and eventually they might take on a facilitation role that wasn't their initial intent intention but building the confidence and knowing how we're working eventually they can evolve in their role can evolve into um, taking on different responsibilities um, so yeah is that that that's the, the key thing through this is the thread through this is about making everyone feel valued within your group that they're they're part of it they take ownership of it and when they know how it works and so they're all singing from the same sheet they're more likely to stick stick with it and um, they know they know the ins and outs of it if you like um, we don't get anybody dropping off from our team for the past two years. This, we still got that same core team. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've got mm -hmm. a couple of people actually that, um, that I'm waiting to see next week that um, express an interest in joining our group. So I'm just saying, well, you know, we'll talk, we'll have a chat with them and then um, we'll invite them along to a session just to sit and observe, mm -hmm. see how they feel. Um, and, that, and then we'll see where it goes. Yeah, see if it's for them. Yeah. And um, so the workshop um, officially ends at sort of twelve forty-five. And um, so if people need to leave and get need to go on to other things, other appointments, um, feel free. It's been so nice for you all to come along. Um, but sorry, I've got some background noise. I live on quite a busy road. <laughs> um, but Jan and I are in no sort of rush to leave. Um, and we've got Thank one you, answer, answered question in the Thank chat. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so if people want to stay on a bit longer, ask any questions and um, have any discussions about anything, then you're welcome. We're happy to stay around until you want us to, but not offended either if you have other things to get to and want to leave. Um, so the end, the, just the last question, Jan, that was in the chat um, mm. was around, um, have you done any training um, for people um, whose sort of English is not their first language? So Shah just asked, um, for example, from the Asian community um, in their mother language? No, but I would welcome that. If anybody, um, you know, we, we can make connections with people that would like to do that. And I have an interpreter or somebody alongside me to support me. I would love to do that. 
So we're open to any suggestions mm. because we want to reach everyone in our community. Yeah, yeah that'd be mm. great. And possibly worth mentioning here that um, in the training that we're doing to set up other star groups, um, these these star groups can be, you know, in any sort of language if there's a need for that. Um, so, for example, we had someone here from the Chinese women's group who was mm -hmm. interested, wasn't she, in setting one up yeah. um, for members of the Chinese community that would be done in that language because the idea being that if people can express themselves better in that language, then that's great. It's great to have that option for them if that's what mm. they want. Mm. it can be it can be tailored can't it definitely yes. yeah definitely mm. um just looking through the chat um we've got oh yeah anna said it'd be good to share at the end of life care clinical network as an example of good practice mm. i don't know about that network but i'm definitely gonna look it up amazing um yeah go for it anna we're a small yeah, group no uh, no it's okay no, it's, it's just that um, a lot of the end-of-life care and palliative care networks are now recognising that grief and bereavement doesn't just occur at end of life. Um, so if you, uh, I can send you, if you email me, mm. I can send you the coordinator for the end-of-life care and palliative care network nationally. And I can also send you the contact for what we call the chain network which is a network that goes out to a lot of public sector organizations particularly nhs and social care across the country and they're always looking for examples of of, of good practice so i've just tweeted about it in terms of and linked it with my former colleague who runs the living grief and bereavement work with Thai charity so that hopefully Amanda will pick it up mm -hmm. and again it will be a really useful model for uh, the Thai charity to look at because I'm sure there are lots and lots of organizations that would benefit from having that kind of peer support uh, bereavement and loss kind of uh, net or you know support in the local communities so it's just a couple of ideas that's all but thank, thank you, you so much Jan for a fantastic session really really loved it and well done amazing I've learned so much from you oh, thank you you're welcome and thank you for okay. yeah, all of your suggestions Anna I'll get in touch right yeah. off um, and yeah share our details share Jan's details as well and um, and yeah, let's see what we can do in terms of sharing it more broadly. Um, that'd be amazing. Um, what else? Oh yes, Nikki's put, um, yeah, Nikki works for um, St Nicholas Hospice in Suffolk um, who do lots of free courses to do with loss and bereavement. Um, that um, actually, Nikki, I looked up on that website the other day because I know we met at a, <laughs> a different event and I, um, I gave that information to someone here in Bristol um, who was going to look it up as well. We're currently doing working with three other, uh, sorry, two other hospices within Suffolk at the moment for Dying Matters Week. Obviously, um, a little bit late to the party, but um, yeah, I've, I've been on lots of courses this week to do with it and learnt loads. Um, so um, yeah, it's, it's really good to get on. They do it every year, um, and um, if you go on to the, the website, um, you can actually see what what courses are available. So. It's really helpful and they're all free. Oh, great. Yeah, it's good to share, isn't it? Mm. Writing that down as well. And um, does anyone else have any questions or comments that they would like to make? I, I would really like to, um, Jan, I'd really like to ask you because um, obviously I work for the hospital, so I've only been doing it for two months, so I, I am a, um, a community connector. So um, I'm sort of working at the moment, getting through um, sort of seeing what's out there, asset mapping and connecting with people already. Mm. Um, but if I was to set up a group, what I would really like to know from you is how do you um, sort of start your conversations? Like, you know, to and what, what do you in involve in your conversations? Do, do you sort of like sort of talk about do you get people in to talk about wheels or things like that do you or is it just about the bereavement itself um do you mean when i'm trying to um to if get have, people to help set the group up when i'm no, trying to no, get a team it's, it's actually once you've now you've got your team in place uh -huh. and you're sitting with the people that have come in to see yes, you yeah 
do you um what you know how do you start your conversations mm. you know, what's a good way that you you know you obviously you've been doing it for a while so it'd be really yeah. good to learn from you what yeah, kind yeah. of a starting conversations to get yes. everybody involved yes what we do every time we, we, we have like a flip chart with the the sort of aims and objectives in and we don't read it all of it in full but we have the big the, the reason why we're here if this is just a reminder the reason why we're here today and we we talk about what we say in our literature that we're here to um, offer you a safe space to feel that you're able to express yourself share any experiences or feelings that you may have about the loss of your loved one and we're here to listen because we understand um we're not here to give you any advice or guidance. Right. We're non is a non-judgmental. Whatever you say is, you know, we talk about confidentiality and make, making people feel safe. And when they know all of that, we then say, okay, what we're going to do now is sort of like, like a round robin, but we don't go around in a circle. So it sort of stresses people out. We say, if you want to talk, then free, you know, be feel free to talk. And what we used to have before the pandemic we had this lovely cushion and it was a lovely velvet cushion with a star on it with those sequins on and we don't we didn't realize how valuable this cushion was but when you've got it on your lap it's like a comfort and people they start playing with this cushion and they talk and when they've got the cushion that's their time to talk how you're feeling how you're feeling about being here how you're feeling about uh, at the moment you know anything you'd like to share and then once they've done that, they put the cushion down or they pass it on to somebody else will talk and, and it's their time. So that's their own time and space to talk. Um, and if you don't want to talk, absolutely fine. Um, and most people, when they first join, they're, they're happy just to listen to other people talk. And eventually they'll do it in their own time. And we, we also make it really clear that we're not, I'm not there as the person leading I'm just nobody knows we just got my name on on there and um, we all share our experiences and things like that and um, we we never ever well very rarely we would use any resources on the table because before you know it the two hours is gone mm. it just leads on to different things so it's never a, a um a theme that we have for the session or whatever it's has as what people bring that they want to talk about um and uh we list, just listen to each other we we often um uh we've got on the table i say we've got some uh, resources as well about different questions um and we we view we made these resources from from um um a, a, a course that i found on the internet for free the bereavement journey it's called and um it's a six-week course and it's again talking about um all different things to do with brief and bereavement, bereavement and um, there's a manual that came along with it and I downloaded it and I cut and pasted some of the questions in it and we made these cards we put them in a tin we get them out sometimes what do you think about this then how do you do, how do people deal with this situation different statements and things like that and that it generates discussion as well sometimes we use that because sometimes people we go off on a tangent and we might want to bring people back and support people in um, to think about how they can be sharing experiences and things um, with each other. So, um, yeah. So, we, do, we do something very similar like that yeah. um, at the um, hospice, but it's, it's, it's geared towards um, sort of children, really, to be honest. But I went on the course, it's really good. And, and they use the same thing. It's like, just open it. Uh, it's called um, Life's Questions. Yeah. And it's like um, just little, you know, she just asks you, you know, a question from this thing and it just opens up loads of discussion. But yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's really good. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's a good thing about questioning as well, because we talked in our tra training that we did before we all we opened the doors to the community was about the way that we question things about, you know, open ended questions and closed questions and paraphrasing and all those sorts of things. How. Um, the people that are coming along for support don't know that we're thinking of those things, if you like, but we're quite mindful of of how we can sort of encourage people to talk about things or make reassure people and and all those sorts of things. Um, and it just flows very well. It just flows. Um, 
but uh, so we have the beginning and then the, we have a, a break with the teas and coffees and people carry on talking throughout that and then it, at the very very end we sort of are mindful of the time where we then we say people we're coming to an end we've got 20 minutes left um and then we start doing the thing again if you want to talk you can talk what do you get from this session what is anything that really um sort of resonated with you what that's been spoken about today how you're feeling what you're going to take away from this session have you got any anxieties things that are coming up we'd like to share and that's how we end the session so we've got a sort of structure um uh, and, and it and it works really well, yeah. Brilliant, yeah. I think um, I, mine's gonna my job's gonna be slightly different um, because obviously um, I'll be going in, obviously opening up sort of um, death literacy questions where uh, building up trust, but able you know be able to talk about whether they are prepared, you know, for again. So I will be supporting people that. Are, you know experience loss but also I'll be sort of asking those sort of difficult questions before you know someone goes as well you know are they yeah. prepared have they made you know funeral arrangements have they you know so it, it will be slightly different my job will be but I've taken a lot away from this actually it's it's a really good way to maybe open up and start a group and uh, use the people that, that are in the community um, already mm. Yeah, and you get people in the group. I mean, some of the people in our team, they they lost their loved one 17 years ago, and some was four years ago, and and some were, uh, and they, they've all got different stories to share of how they've dealt with different things. And then people that join the group, you I think you never know for that they are coming along for support. You never know until you've made that initial one to one meeting with them to find out their situation um if they feel that it's you know they, they need to be reassured that they're they're coming to this group and they know what support is available but sometimes it might be that um it might be too too soon for them to come to the group and other people I, we've had one person come along and it was um within uh, a month after she lost her husband um so there we you know we it's just great to hear people share their stories because they they all sort of know they're on this journey. There's people in front of them um, that have gone through different experiences that they can help support, and there's people behind them that they 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 um yeah we're all learning from each other, aren't we? When we're doing this type of thing, really. Um, so that that's the, the beauty of the peer peer support. No one's a. We're not saying we're professionals in every anything we're doing. We're we're sharing our experiences and offering that support by listening. Brilliant. Mm. Anything else okay. you would like to ask or comment on? Sorry, it's me again. I just want to ask okay. one thing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's just I'm just thinking of someone that I'm working with at the moment out in the community, and she's sort of about my age so she's around 50 mark and um the problem she's having at the moment is is that you know a lot of the people that she a lot of the groups that she's going to are people a lot older than herself and she wants to find groups within her own age group and mm -hmm. and i think that's a little bit more difficult do you have a varied age group they're they're mostly older people um the youngest is in her 40s mid 40s um one of the team or team members was in her late 20s um so yeah it you know i think but i think this is the sort of thing where once people start coming along if they feel that they would feel more comfortable in a, a group of different ages or for another thing is we, we've got um one man that comes to our group and he was quite reluctant. It's like, oh no, I don't know how I'm going to fit in with this. You know, I'm not, I'm not very good at expressing myself and this, that, and the other. And actually, he came along. He, he, he actually loves being part of the group. He, can, he feels very supported and he's able to express himself and things. But we, we've sort of talked about maybe starting a, a men's group, a men's only group, um, or you might want to do a group for people with a particular age because they feel that they were able to feel more comfortable so whatever you if you're encouraging people to come along and talk about those things anyway eventually hopefully it will 
you know, um, people, you have spin-offs from this particular group where when they feel confident, confident, that younger person might say, actually, I'd like to, to run this alongside your group or something. So the, yeah, there's, and because it, it's, because again, it's, because it's, um, it's, we're not volunteering for an organization, you can make those changes. You can be very flexible in the way that you manage this. Um, but again, you would, you would then put it into your terms of reference. Any decisions you make within the, the group, the team, we we'll put it into the terms of reference. If we've agreed, actually, if this happens, we can go off and do this and that and the other. And everyone's in agreement. And it, it naturally just progresses in many ways then. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. Okay. I wonder as well, just to add to that, is about if when it is set up, just getting a variety of people to promote it, really, and because mm. everyone has their own network, some um, people will make assumptions about it. So, like at AJK Bristol, we share it as far far and wide as we can. But naturally, when it comes from us, people assume it's a group just for older people, and um, mm. and even if we say it's not, it's for all ages, and um, that's what they assume. So, also trying to get like younger persons organisations and. Um, and like mixed age groups to share it yeah. and mm -hmm. just to reach different people at different stages. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had another point, Nikki, and I completely forgot now what it is that I was going to add. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, I don't know. <laughs> Go for it, Anna. <laughs> sorry, just, just as you were talking about um, age-related um, groups, I just wondered whether or not you've reached out to the schools in your local patch or the education department at the local authority. And the reason I say that is one of the things that we found when we were working around the dementia agenda specifically were the number of young people who were experiencing grief and loss and there's absolutely nowhere for them to go. Mm. Yeah, we haven't because it, it, um, I think we, when you when you're initially setting it up, is is that softly softly approach? Is it, if we tell too many, oh, we could be inundated with people wanting to come forward, and then how do we manage it? Yeah. So I think as we we sort of get get more and more established, we then um, can be thinking of those those um, avenues because, yeah, I mean making those contacts with people that are, are out in the community or, or connecting with families and things like that. We want we want to spread the word as far and wide as possible, but we need to be obviously man mindful that we need to be able to manage this. Um, but that, yeah, that's, that's definitely something that we can do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yes. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Your, um, all of your resources in the chat. I'm going to look them all up. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. Thank Thanks you. Bye bye then. Bye. bye.